welcome to Critical Conversations, a Latinx learning series powered by the Ford Foundation and the Latinx House. Today's episode is Achieving Equity for the Latinx Community. And now, welcome the co-founder of the Latinx House, Monica Ramirez. Hello and welcome to our final segment of our six-part series, Critical Conversations, this Latinx learning series. This series is presented in partnership between the Ford Foundation and the Latinx House. I cannot believe that we are here having this conversation after so many rich conversations before. My name is Monica Ramirez and I'm the co-founder of the Latinx House. The Latinx House is a home base for people who appreciate, support, and celebrate the excellence of the Latinx, Latine community. We, along with the Ford Foundation, understand the systemic issues rooted in oppression that impact our communities on a daily basis, how they are portrayed, how we are perceived, and how we are treated is directly correlated to our dignity and our ability to thrive. Achieving equity for the Latine community needs to be more than just a North Star. It must be centered and resourced when we look at social and economic changes across our country. We've been saying throughout this series that historically less than 1% of philanthropic dollars are directed to the Latine community. We all know that that is unacceptable and it cannot continue. Yet when we look at the demographics of this country, we see that our community is not only growing in population size, we've contributed significantly throughout history. Even where philanthropic investment has not continued or increased, we have continued to give economically, culturally, and politically. The scale is deeply unbalanced, and that has been the thrust of the conversations that we've had over the past five months. Be it through power building and storytelling, or understanding the historic context and reality of immigrants, or how the criminal justice system works or doesn't work in our country, and having a better understanding of the experiences of workers across our nation. Laying that groundwork leads us to today, a conversation that is a culmination of those first five conversations. To borrow from Maya Angelou, now that we know better, how do we do better? I am thrilled that we're closing out this series with two powerhouse women who I admire greatly. Hillary Pennington, Executive Vice President of Programs for the Ford Foundation, and Carmen Rojas, President and CEO of the Margaret Casey Foundation. Carmen and Hillary are both making important moves and changes in philanthropy, including champion championing the needs of the Latine Latinx community. We're so grateful to have them with today. To help me set the framework for how we do better, please welcome Manuela Arciegas, a program officer at the Ford Foundation. Thank you, Monica. The Ford Foundation and the Latinx House set out to create this learning series to tackle a few key issues. We cannot build equitable, robust, thriving communities if we do not account for the civic engagement, development, and power of Latine communities. When we talk about what it means to invest in the future of this nation, we must address the millions of Latine children who will soon become voters and working people in their own communities. According to the Pew Research Center, the number of young Latinos, a whopping 35 million people, increased 20% from a decade earlier, making it one of the largest and fastest growing youth populations in the country. With a median age of 28 years old, Latinos are also the nation's youngest major racial or ethnic group. The three states with the most Hispanics also had a biggest increase to this population from 2010 to 2019. Texas saw a 2 2 million increase, California 1.5 million, and Florida 1.4 million. These states account for half of the U.S. Hispanic population growth during this time. The smallest increases came in West Virginia, Wyoming, Maine, and Vermont, yet no state saw a decrease in Latine people. By region, the South saw the fastest growth in Latine populations, an increase of 26% from 2010 to 2019, followed by the Northeast at 18%, 
the Midwest at also 18%, and the West at 14%. The South has accounted for nearly half, 48% of Latina population growth since 2010. Yet we've heard throughout the series that population does not equate destiny. And so we are here today to catalyze action to ensure that this growing population of Latina people are invested in, empowered, and resourced to create change. This series has aimed to name the fact that this underinvestment is longstanding and reinforces a Latinx community inability to thrive, but we can change that. We know that only 1% of philanthropic investments support the Latina community. This data point has remained stagnant for nearly half a century, dating back to Hispanic and philanthropy's very first survey on philanthropic giving nearly 45 years ago. 45 years later, we are still here. Despite underinvestment, Latina people contribute immensely in a myriad of ways, including to the economy. Latinas represent 25% of the gross domestic product. And still, they're twice as likely to be living at or below the poverty line compared to white non-Hispanics. Talk about making a dollar out of 15 cents. Home ownership rates are 25% lower than their white counterparts. Latinas earn only 49 cents on the dollar compared to others. And this large gap is the largest amongst all people of color groups in this country. Today, I'm excited that this final conversation in the Latinx House series will explore solutions to the intersectional challenges facing Latina communities. The next 45 years of giving cannot look like the last 45. I'm hopeful this conversation with you all will spark your will to collaborate and to take courageous philanthropic action. Thank you. Thank you, Manuela. And thank you all for tuning in. Now, let's welcome our guests and our moderator. To continue our conversation, achieving equity for the Latinx community, welcome the Executive Vice President of Programs for the Ford Foundation, Hillary Pennington, and the President and CEO of the Marguerite Casey Foundation, Dr. Carmen Rojas. And now welcome today's conversation moderator, the co-author of Axios Latino and reporter Noticias del Mundo, Marina Elisa Franco. Hola, bienvenidos everyone. Welcome to the final in the series of critical conversations by the Latinx House and the Ford Foundation. We are very excited uh, to be able to go last but not least. Um, and we're going to have a very interesting conversation with Hilary Pennington and with uh, Dr. Carmen Rojas. Uh, so to kick things off, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for joining us. Um, before we start to sort of set the stage of how philanthropy can and should be working towards uh, helping the Latina communities, I was wondering if you could speak to how you yourself arrived at philanthropy. Um, Carmen, I know in particular you were among the first, if not the first Latina in a major uh, endowment organization. Uh, and it's always hard to be the first, but it's always notable. I don't know if you can sort of speak to what interested you about philanthropy initially. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Marina. And thank you so much for this invitation to be a part of this uh, critical conversation. As I've been following the arc of these conversations, I feel like I'm always stretching the ways that I'm uh, thinking about not only our work at Marguerite Casey Foundation, but my leadership as a Latina in this moment. So I'm not the first, uh, but there are many uh, amazing uh, Latinx leaders in philanthropy way before me. I'm currently uh, the only Latina who runs a, a foundation with an endowment of our size. Uh, and, you know, it was... Uh, in part accidental uh, and in part um, uh, uh, circumstantial. There were a lot of people in my life in philanthropy who made uh, available and made visible the ways that the tools, the platform, the resources that foundations have in this country 
could create space for leaders on the front lines of the most important fights in our country to actually take on those fights, to dream up a better world, to build relationships with each other and to sort of deepen roots in community. And so I was always intrigued by that. I am of the fundamental belief that money matters. And uh, all, the moment I started working philanthropy really in, uh, Right after graduate school, I worked at a racial justice foundation in Oakland, California. I um, uh, was so curious, not only about sort of the grant making work, but sort of the full range of resources that make uh, foundations such a powerful set of rails on which we achieve racial and economic justice in this country. And so um, it was in part uh, access and support from a whole num a whole host of uh, amazing leaders who worked inside and outside of philanthropy. And frankly, it's a commitment that I have to being able to use my role to uh, create bubbles of oxygen, frankly, for leaders uh, on the front on the front lines of these fights and, and philanthropy felt and still feels like the most effective way to make that happen. And uh, Hillary, how about you? Uh, you certainly have a long career of working towards uh, creating more social justice initiatives in the philanthropy world. How did you arrive at that? You know, well, thank you for that. And Carmen, for the really inspiring things that you just said about philanthropy. So for me, uh, it was unintentional. And to just quite kind of keep it real, I still feel ambivalent about being in philanthropy. I came into philanthropy after having been um, the leader of a nonprofit organization for 20 years. And a lot of what attracted me was actually um, a great deal of frustration for what I felt foundations didn't do well that I wanted to try to change um, because I experienced uh, very, um, partial kinds of relationships with philanthropy. So it has all the power that Carmen just described, but I felt like it was it was fighting with, you know, one hand tied behind its back because it didn't have a relationship with the nonprofit organizations that it funded, mine included, um, that was high trust, uh, multi-year. Um, and so I came into philanthropy after leading an organization for 20 years, Jobs for the Future, um, which I helped to found. Uh, and the first place that I worked was the Gates Foundation. And part of what attracted me was they were at the beginning, um, they had just received their gift from Warren Buffett. And they were, um, so they had the challenge of doubling their payout and trying to figure out what else, what more should they be doing in the United States to fight inequality. So that felt like a great opportunity to really um, make an impact. And I was there for seven years. And then I tried to leave philanthropy and I did a couple of other things. But when Darren came to Ford, he seduced me to come and join him. And I've been here for um, heading on now for 10 years. So I like to keep a balance between the years in the nonprofit sector and my years in philanthropy and never to change my fundamental um, allegiance to people working on the front lines uh, and trying to be a, a really effective partner for uh, for our grantees, as well as obviously for the issues of social justice, which is not the only thing philanthropy focuses on, but needs to be um, a focus for the changes we seek for the world we want to build. Absolutely. Now, Hillary, of course, you touched on one of the issues that brings us here today for this conversation, which is philanthropy has lofty goals, but sometimes uh, falls short. Um, so, for example, the organization Hispanics and Philanthropy, to which both of your organizations uh, collaborate with, uh, it has found that throughout the years, out of all the grants, out of all the funds that are dispensed yearly in the United States, only between 1.3 and 1.5 percent end up in organizations focused on issues that pertain to the Latinx communities. Um, that is an abysmally low number. There's no other way to put it. So what do you think can and should be the goalpost to sort of move up from that, move forward from that, um, even with the sort of faults, if we can call them that, that philanthropy has uh, traditionally had in the past? Um, Gavin, I don't know if you want to go first. Oh, sure, sure. Um, 
I think that there are a couple of things, right? Like the the challenge right now that uh, uh, the lack the Latinx community is facing in terms of access to resources is true for all organizations led by people of color, led by poor people, led by marginalized people, right? So there's like a, a, a real lack of, there's like a mismatch in terms of the ways in which philanthropy talks about, and especially uh, racial and economic justice philanthropy talks about the need to support organizations led by folks who are most proximate to the issues uh, and communities that we care about and the number of dollars that go to them. I think that there's uh, above and beyond Hispanics in philanthropy, there have been a number of really amazing uh, studies put out in the last couple of years naming this mismatch in resource. You know, I am uh, an organizer in my heart. And so uh, I feel like on the one side, we keep producing information to tell the same abysmal story as you described it, Marina. And on the other side, we lack the organizing infrastructure to be able to hold philanthropy accountable to actually giving more resources. And frankly, in the way that Hillary described it, right? More resources over longer periods of time uh, in the form of multi-year general operating support that allows for leaders on the Latinx, in the Latinx community and frankly, again, across communities of color, across marginalized communities to do both the dreaming and the building work to make that happen. So um, the call for me is to organize, right? Like how are organizations coming together to actually unite their voice and say, not only are we deserving of more resources because we are a greater number of the population, but that this mismatch between the ways in which we talk about our commitment to racial justice and the ways we resource uh, our commitment to racial justice is very real. So I, I, uh, I'm really focused on that. You know, I'm really proud that at Marguerite Casey Foundation, an overwhelming majority of our grant recipients are from and are from communities of color organizations overwhelmingly led by folks of color uh, who are on the front lines of this fight and i think the other work is just to model right like the the story that philanthropy has often been told is that our communities are high risk communities that we don't know how to manage a budget we don't know how to raise resources i i uh i think that that those are all um conditions that foundations should actually work to disrupt and create and uh, create room for leaders to actually do and build things. Like Hillary, I ran an organization before this and my, um, like my sweet spot for Hillary is that anytime I was out in the world speaking as a Ford Foundation grant recipient, Hillary made it a point, one, to ask me a question. And that was like a symbolic, like that means something, right? To have somebody in a job like Hillary say, hey, Carmen, your ideas matter. And I, in this room, am going to ask you a question. She had like a level of curiosity to me and to my work and to my leadership that I found so helpful, right? Like there's, there's, what Hillary is describing in terms of like the, the tension between funders and leaders of organization is true. And I always found um, a, two things, like a tenderness and a curiosity to my leadership that is often not afforded to leaders of color, especially by white leaders in philanthropy. There was like always a, um, like a, a deep commitment uh, to that curiosity that Hillary brought to my interactions with her. And I think there's the simplicity of being able to engage in such a meaningful way and create space that's powerful. And I think groups need to organize, right? Like I, if, if folks want more, we know that organizing works. And so um, being able to create examples like the one I just described in Hillary's leadership and it, like if if there is an ups, there's uh, I don't know how many years year after year we have to collect this data before people take action and I'm curious about what that action looks like Marina. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting uh, because Hillary, for example, just mentioned uh, that there's sometimes a lack of high trust, you know. But certainly bigger institutions, the Ford Foundation included have been making progress in that regard. I don't know, Hillary, if you could sort of speak to the flip side of that with sort of the build initiative, the build project, and how even if historically there has been 
very, very few investments in this. In the past five years, especially, there's starting to be uh, a sort of better situation in that regard. Well, um, thank you, Marina. And first of all, Carmen, thank you. I mean, I, I, if I had a recording of this, I would play that back. Um, but you know, I, I also really feel that's the job of people like me. That's our job um, in philanthropy, especially for white leaders in a time like now. And those statistics that you just shared with us, Marina, are shocking and unacceptable, and we all have to change them. And I think one of the reasons why we have to change them is that there is not a single issue that any foundation in this country is working on, whether it's environmental justice or healthcare or education or social justice issues um, that should not include and center the Latina population. It's a huge population. It's a growing population. It's a complicated population that gives us an opportunity as a nation to complicate our binary, you know, black, white, racial narrative. So what what richer and more important um, community could there be for us to center and to learn from? So I agree with what Carmen said. It's a mystery, given that, um, that, it, that it is a community that remains virtually invisible to philanthropy. So I think part of the action, answer for sure is organizing within the community itself and what would it mean for philanthropy to support that kind of organizing you know because that is going to take infrastructure organizations like like hip and it is going to take advocacy organizations um, as well as organizations that are working on issues um, to be seen by foundations and then i think on the foundation side we have to figure out how to center this more in our conversations about everything um you know to the to the points that I started with. And there, I think it is beginning to understand better our own um, behaviors. You know, I think some of the reports that CEP has done demonstrate that leaders of color feel uncomfortable talking to people in philanthropy. We do have expectations that are often um, prevent us from seeing talent and backing organizations and taking risks um, that we should take. So I think this needs, you know, the good news is that there are a large and growing number of Latina leaders in philanthropy. My amazing colleagues at the Ford Foundation, Carmen and others. So they are part of that organizing force within philanthropy to claim space and to require attention. But but the rest of us have to do that too. Um, and so, and I think you know there should not be a single conference on philanthropy that does not, in some way, um, address the issues of the Latin A community. And then, you know, of course, just in closing on this, I appreciate what Carmen is saying that there is a broader group of communities of color that are too often marginalized, who know better than any foundation what they need and the most effective mm -hmm. ways to help their communities make progress. So we do have to flip the switch and um, and um, flip the paradigm if we're going to get where we want to go on any issue. Marina, can I actually, I think that uh, Hillary presents like such an important point, like the thing about how funding comes to Latinx organizations in this moment is that it's so issue circumscribed, right? So like uh, immigration is the animating force. That's the way to fund Latino communities. And I hold that in a context in which I think a lot, I was a, Manuel Pastor was my undergraduate advisor, and he has a data point that I hear him say all the time, which is uh, in California, the number one group that believes that climate change is real and works to fight climate change is the Latino community, right? So like the ability to say that we are not a single issue community, that we are actually at the forefront of a set of critical fights from worker justice to climate justice, in racial justice, that there is um, a need to break, yeah, I'm gonna take Hillary's words, right? Like break the paradigms or the silos in which our communities exist. Because in our day-to-day -day lives, there's a very real lived experience of, of spanning right like of spanning the set of issues that frankly impact all of us uh, we just happen to be the most impacted the most hurt the most harmed the least powerful to inform how those issues uh, are not only framed but solved in our communities and i want to make sure that there's like a greater 
uh, a greater shift in the balance of power so that uh, we have more room to inform what it looks like in a meaningful way to be meaningful participants in, in shaping real solutions. Absolutely, that is uh, sort of harkens a lot to the point where there's definitely siloing. There's a lot of when you do see investments in uh, Latin era philanthropic uh, initiatives, it's sometimes for education, it's sometimes for immigration. Yeah. But as we all know, and we love to say, Latinos are not a monolith. Um, we are affected by a multiplicity of, of things. There are indigenous Latinas who are affected the same way as Native Americans in many ways. There's racism in the community, there's LGBTQ phobia, there are sort of all of these interconnected problems that affect everyone but aren't tackled holistically, as you mentioned. So I wonder, uh, sort of from your very ample experience for the both of you sort of working in this world, do you have any examples of times when there has been a sort of more interesting, more innovative way to counter those disparities in a more sort of holistic uh, way? Well, can I jump in on that for a minute? Because I, I think it actually, to Carmen's point about organizing, it needs to be both and. So yes, it is true that the Latina community suffers in, you know, from being siloed. And it is also true that we have to organize so that funders who fund in silos, education, environment, economic justice, whatever those are, see this community and see it and understand it as essential to the outcomes that they seek, A. And B, when they fund organizations that, uh, that work with the community, they look for organizations that are led by people from that community and they support them in a wholesome way. They don't say, I have this strategic objective and I'm gonna give you a grant to help me achieve my goal, they say, what is important to you as an organization? What calls you to this work? How can I help support you to be successful as you work on education, understanding that you are part of a broader community and you experience issues as whole, as whole people, a whole community. So I think there is still, or I wouldn't want to leave behind the funders that are very issue specific. I think we need to work to transform them. And I think there needs to be a real change in the money that goes, that is dedicated to the community itself, you know, to the things that Carmen was saying about building power, building infrastructure, building data, building knowledge, building leadership pipelines, all of those things need specific kinds of funding um, themselves. And, you know, what I would say, you know, from the Ford experience, and we're a big, clunky, bureaucratic, old organization. We're not nimble the way Marguerite Casey is. And we learn a lot from and from foundations like you that are so much more nimble than we are. Um, but we've we've had to, to just like draw the line and take a stand. So the first thing we did early in Darren's and my tenure here was, was with our build initiative. But when we created that initiative, we said, not only are we gonna move in the direction of multi-year general operating support grants that include a, a component of organizational strengthening. But from day one, we're gonna require that 40% of our grant dollars get spent in that way. Meaning from the experience of a program officer, we, we were taking their budget and telling them they had to spend that budget in a certain way, which was not originally popular. But we, we chose not to start in a small way. We chose not to start with the coalition of the willing. We chose to say, we're doing this as an entire institution and we're gonna swing for the fences. Um, so that was one thing that let us begin to make this shift. And then, and that transformed the relationships that our program officers had with their grantees. They found themselves suddenly in much more trusting relationships where they could be much um, more true partners. So to me, one of the metrics that makes me the proudest about my colleagues at Ford is that while we made that declaration when we started out, now 70% of our grants are made that way because people are choosing to do that on their own. They just understand that that's a better way to make the change they seek. Um, and then the second thing, we, we also um, choose, we made a deliberate decision to choose four organizations led by people of color. Doesn't mean there's a, you know, you don't need organizations led by people who are, look like me, but we, but at some point foundations have to change their choices if we're gonna create the change we make in the world. So we also 
disproportionately fund organizations led by people of color. 70% of our grantees are led by people of color. And when we went to the markets to do our social justice bond as COVID was beginning, um, we, we really used that extra infusion of resources, a billion dollars, to turbocharge um, support to those kinds of organizations, um, understanding that their ability to see and diagnose the moment and to um, have resources that they control would let them um, innovate. So I'm thinking about like Justice for Migrant Women, one of our grantees. And, you know, in general, they've been working on changing, challenging the fact that Latinas are being paid 50 cents to 57 cents to the dollar that white non-Hispanic men get. But they also, with the Social Justice Fund, were able to be part of the Always Essential campaign, which brought about huge wins around pandemic relief for undocumented workers in New York. So thanks to their work, much of which was driven by Latinx workers and leaders, New York State allocated you know, over $2 billion of support to undocumented workers. So I think that's an example of where what you want is you want for your grantees to be able, you know, you don't want them to have to come back to you and say, oh, please, can I have your permission to work on this emerging need that I, I now see? You want them to be empowered um, to be the first movers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's something that brings about the point that, you know, there's a lot of talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion right now in a lot of corporate boards and a lot of boards. Um, in what ways have you found in your careers sort of similar ways like what Hillary just mentioned to have more voices to better the reach of the work that you're doing, but also to better the focus of it and have better and sort of fuller input? Yeah, um, uh, I would say that we are like the I think about philanthropy as like a pipeline, right? And there are like different types of philanthropic organizations uh, that have different jobs. My expectation isn't that, and it should never be that, um, uh, every foundation, every philanthropic leader, every donor behaves the way that I do. My expectation is that we offer a model of what it looks like to offer multi-year, general operating support, long-term commitments to local organizations on the ground who are actively organizing communities who have been left out of the conversations about what our democracy looks like and what our economy looks like. And so for us, I feel like there are a couple of things. I came into this job, I feel like Hillary, you and I were on a panel my first yeah. week on this job which is so long ago, <laughs> it's two years, this week, it's like two years ago. Um, oh and uh, I started in the middle of COVID and stepped into an organization that for 20 years had been doing multi-year general operating support overwhelmingly to organizing groups. That's, that's what we did to, to date. 90% of our grants are multi-year general operating support. We have made a couple of shifts. Um, and I also talk like from, our grant making practice to our institution. So like in our grant making practice, we made a shift where we committed to doing, to being 25% of an organization's budget for up to five years. And I think that that creates a runway for people who are leading racial and economic justice organizations, not only to build and do, but that's like an operating budget, right? Like you don't have to raise your wage year after year, you know, you have a, a runway to prove something out. I think, in our internal practices, we've spent a whole lot of time. I think this thing that Hillary is describing, like the tension between how uh, the practice of day-to-day -day philanthropy often lends itself to surveillance and control of grant recipients and managing uh, grant recipients. We needed to shift that, frankly, and it's not been easy. Uh, and it's not been easy for a whole host of reasons. And the gift has been for me to have very real insights into the incentives and disincentives in philanthropy to let go power and control. And it's actually uh, very hard. <laughs> it's, that practice is very hard and we are on that journey to make that real. I'll say in our investment practice, we updated our investment policy statement to actually reflect a commitment 
not only to having more managers who are women and people of color broadly, but to actually talk specifically about having underrepresented people of color act as manager for our endowment. Again, we are uh, a small but, but mighty institution, but it's a billion dollars that we can use the heft of to build a whole network of managers who are overwhelmingly Latinx, overwhelmingly Black, who otherwise would not have access to our capital. We changed the rules to make these resources easier to get. And then lastly, it was our board. You know, I stepped into this role at a moment in which um, we had a number of board members who are leaving. And with my uh, sort of a small sub subset of my uh, past board with the board that I stepped in with, we had a very real and meaningful conversation about what it meant, frankly, to like follow the model of a Ford Foundation, where they had organizers on their board, where they had thought leaders on their board, where they had people on the front line, people who they were also giving grant dollars to help inform the philanthropic practice. That that was not a conflicting commitment, but that was a true commitment to racial and economic justice. And we're, as a result, we're able to have folks like Marisa Franco, who runs Mi Gente, join our board, mm -hmm. Julian Castro, former HUD secretary, join our board, and frankly, offer an insight into not only what it means to be a broad and very different su subsections of Latinx leadership, right, in this moment, but also to be in conversation with a group of overwhelmingly leaders of color who have a depth of commitment to our institution and our mission and to grapple with what that looks like in a meaningful way. And so those are the sort of the top lines for me right now, Marina. Okay. I, I was just going to say, you know, again, um, amen and, uh, and largely ditto, you know, so Ford also, we, and this is again, you know, I think one th strategy that foundations can use is the idea of internal um, innovation. You know, we, we spend a lot of time wondering why is it that so many foundations are slow, so slow to change and so resistant to change, despite all the evidence that we've just been talking about. Um, and I think there are multiple stakeholders and each of them uses a slightly different decision-making calculus, but we have found in our investments also, you know, we, we, we our board approved a billion dollars that we can reuse in mission related investments. And one of the key um, of three things that we spend that money on that we invest in is building um, management, financial management firms that are led by people of color. So diverse managers that's, and, and we're, you know, we're a major investor in trying to help those kinds of organizations grow. But oh, lo and behold, with the rest of our endowment over time, not even over time, but very quickly, they have begun to shift who um, they turn to for managers of our of our investments. So um, a dedicated investment in one part of the organization has been able to stimulate change in a bigger part of the organization. You know, for us too, our board is really essential. Um, all the things that Carmen said, you know, it it is, a board that includes the communities and the grantees that we fund. Um, and it is more than half people of color and it is more than half women. Same with our leadership team. And I think those things actually matter. It's not like you need to have a quota, but there is a, a time when you reach a critical mass or a tipping point. And once you are that, that is who you are, mm -hmm. it, what comes with that is you bring all those identities and, and you, you, you understand how deeply intersectional the work of social justice is. You understand why it is that you, you know, that the greatest wisdom will come from communities closest to the ground, um, most proximate uh, to the causes. So I think when, you know, anyone interested in either organizing from the outside or organizing from the inside, focusing on those kinds of changes in leadership seizing the opportunity to create, you know, dedicated innovations that start to move the needle. If you can't change everything at once, um, you know, resource those. And in our experience, I think one of the other problems with philanthropy is we all tend to be short-termists, short-termism. You know, it takes decades to change the kinds of issues that we're working on, if not lifetimes. So don't think in terms of a two or three year initiative, even inside your own institution, it's not gonna get you there. If you're going to start on a serious change effort, it needs to be a five or six, you know, phase one year, phase one, and you need to um, put dedicated resources against it. 
And that's, that includes, Absolutely. you know, DEI more broadly. Yeah, yeah. Taylor, you touch on something that I think is critical, which is uh, a lot of times in the past when funds are dispersed to these groups, it's like a, here's something for six months uh, and then, you know, you stop worrying about what happened. But something that both of you have mentioned uh, with what you're doing in, in your organizations is sort of committing to something that's longer term. And I wonder if you could speak to what you have found to be the best practices that hopefully other organizations, other institutions, be they great, be they small, can sort of take away from your experience so that this walk towards equity stands out in the long term. That in two years, if the pandemic is past this, people don't forget what came of it um, and what sort of commitments can and should be made in that sense. I feel like there are a couple of things that Hillary said that I just wanna like uh, double tap. Um, one is the silo busting, right? Like I think it's our job as people in philanthropic institutions to be in spaces that are not comfortable or unique to our work, to be able to press on the, the boundaries on who is invited to these conversations. So mm -hmm. uh, a good example for us is that, you know, we're not a family foundation, but I'll go to a family foundation conference to talk about our work and to talk about our grant recipients. Uh, we're not explicitly a climate funder. We fund some climate organizations, but if there's a climate conference, I'll go and bring a grant recipient and, and talk about our work. And I feel like there's that practice. Again, I wanna go back to my, um, Hillary's impression on me as I was running Workers Lab before I had this job, right? Like, uh, I think that she modeled what it looks like to have a position of leadership and authority in a major film, global philanthropic organization and tell me in so many subtle and direct ways that my ideas and leadership mattered uh, and signal to a room of people that that was true as well. Uh, it made it easy for me to meet with other funders. It just made so many things easier for me, right? Uh, and I think that there are those sort of uh, internal practices. I think there's the external practices of organizing, right? So um, being able to partner with leaders of ph other philanthropic organizations to say that we are gonna push an agenda that's committed to racial justice. I feel like Ford does this in, a, in an amazing way, right? Like being able to name that, our institutions in and of themselves are insufficient to catalyze the change. And it's so much more powerful and better to go at it together, helps move the entire field. It creates like room uh, for the entire philanthropic community to make the moves that I think are necessary as a best practice. So uh, moving away from the like, I gotta go it alone, like this is ours and attribution and towards like, if we do this together, it creates not only greater impact, but um, greater room for us to learn uh, about what best philanthropic practice is and can look like. Uh, and I think the third thing is frankly, like being in a depth of relationship with our grant recipients, uh, like listening. <laughs> I feel like that's the vast majority of this job is that you should sit and listen and learn. The gift for me of running a foundation is truly the opportunity to, to sit in rooms with people and hear and learn and change my way of moving in the world based on the things that people are experiencing in their day-to-day -day lives. That's uh, that's like a um, such a delight, uh, and I feel like coming into level of certainty is is a tough. It's like a fool's errand because you should be learning all the time, and that. Uh, that feels like a best practice, right? Like it's an orientation to uh, beginning again and continuing to learn. Yeah, I really, I well, I really agree with what um, Carmen just said. So um, such important points. And I just would add a couple. I, I think at the individual level, like the individual practitioner in philanthropy, a few things, never, ever, ever organize a conference or a meeting that does not 
um, is not intentional about diversity and really, really think about whose voices you feature as the experts and the authorities. So that goes from how you constitute panels to who you invite to be in the room. Um, you know, none of us should ever be showing up at meetings anymore that are not um, fully diverse and representative in every dimension. So that's one, just make sure you do that and make sure your institution does that. You know, second, I agree with Carmen, you know, the easy, not the easy, but from a personal practice point of view, at least again, speaking from my own experience, the most joyous things are the meetings that you have with grantees where you really do get to listen. The hardest things are the meetings you don't take. And because you know that the organization doesn't quote fit um, with, with your institution strategies, and you have to figure out how to make room for those organizations and those people. You can't take every one of those meetings. You can't have every one of those conversations. But at an individual level, if you're not extending yourself for organizations you know you will never fund, and then being in a conversation that is open and still offering to try to be helpful to them, even if you're, you know your foundation won't fund them, you know that's a, that's a practice, I think, that is important. Um, and then, you know, I think from an institutional point of view, it, it, it is all the things that we've just been talking about, you know, which is really beginning to shift the nature, depth and length of, of, uh, of your funding and to take every opportunity when you work with foundations that don't work in that way to dispel the myths that if you somehow move in a trust based direction, you're giving up on impact or accountability because that's a false dichotomy. That's just not true. But we still have a lot of unpacking to do, even if the philanthropic and you know sector is diverse, as you said, Carmen, and it's not realistic to think that every funder will behave in the same way. We still should dispel the myths that, that hold people back from doing these kinds of practices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that sort of brings us back to a point that Carmen mentioned early on about disrupting misperceptions uh, of what it means to sort of make an investment in certain groups. And I wonder if by any chance you think, or maybe it's not the case, that technology can kind of help do it. Is there like a way now for those disbursements and the grant making to become easier to reach populations that it didn't before through technology? Carmen, you want me to go first? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, yes, I, yes, uh, definitely 100% that is true. But I think what grantees would say is don't let technology substitute for the relationship. You know, they, the, the relationship in philanthropy still is everything. So, you know, even when there are amazing um, funders like, uh, you know, what, um, oh, I'm just blanking on her name, Mackenzie uh, Scott is doing, you know, that is a blessing for the foundation, for the institutions that get that resource. And it's a challenge because she says, here's a grant. It's a one-time grant. I want to back you, but I don't want to be building a relationship with you. So I think we can't let technology get in the way of relationships, but technology is an enormous asset. I mean, all of us as foundations had to figure out how to get money out the door during COVID when we weren't in our offices. And if we didn't use technology, we wouldn't have been able to get that done. But um, my favorite example of this is we, we fund an organization on the continent of Africa called um, uh, Africa No Filter, and they have figured out how to give micro grants to individual artists by using what transfers of cash through Western Union. So, you know, it, you can go really, really small and reach a large scale. And I think our imaginations um, stop us. But absolutely, technology makes it easier to do rapid cycle um, grant making uh, and, you know, request for proposals and get money out the door much faster and to a more diverse range of organizations, for sure. Yeah, I would just add uh, that my the jam up for me, Marina, in that question is that many of us are already using technology to get money out the door, right? So like we just had a board meeting, uh, grants were approved by our board. We essentially had everybody's banking information so we could move the money out. Uh, I, I love what you said, Hillary, right? Like it's not a proxy for relationships. Uh, and I think that relationships really matter. And I frankly worry that in the moment and time of COVID, both through like the technology that exists 
that makes meetings like this possible. And through things like social media, we have allowed that to replace the hard work of being in relationship with each other, of building with each other, of learning from each other, that it's um, easy to be in a conversation uh, of conflict on Zoom. It's actually pretty hard to do that in person. And so I'm trying to figure out how we as an organization don't privilege technology as a substitute for relationship building. I, I think that uh, relationship uh, building is really, it's really so critical. Uh, it's the, it's like the boost that people need. And, and frankly, in this moment, uh, a way for us to tether our fates to get, uh, together in a more meaningful way. Absolutely. Um... Thank you so much for your time. Now, to sort of uh, wrap this up and conclude, I'd like to ask both of you to think five years from now, what what do you think your hopes and expectations of how progress has been made in reaching more of the Latinx community? I don't know if, uh, Hillary, you want to go first. I would go back to sort of the the both and um, statement that I made in the beginning. I think first you would want to see that shocking and unacceptable number be different, that 1%. Um, a, a, a lot different, like you would want it to be in the double digits and moving upwards um, and that that needs to happen in a three to five year period. And you would want to see that a lot of that money was going to build the essential organizing infrastructure, what Carmen talked about before. Um, of a wealth of diverse kinds of organizations that are working to advance the needs and interests of the community. Um, and you would want to see um, Latine led organizations being a much greater proportion of grantees of every foundation on every issue um, that they work on, but that the funding would be more holistic, more multi-year, and the relationships would be, um, would be higher trust. And I don't, you know, I think we need to be thinking about numerical goals as a floor, not a ceiling, uh, but that would be um, an aspiration. I love the work of Latinx House for a whole host of reasons. I love Monica for a whole host of reasons. And I think that uh, what Hillary is describing as like floors as a number is a meaningful thing. And I think our sector as a point of departure is also a meaningful thing. So that I think getting more, having more nonprofits with more money that are led by and serving Latinx communities is important. And for me, the promise of an organization like Latinx House is that that then leads into more cultural representation, more books being published and written by Latinx authors, more folks in the media like you, Marina, who are Latina and out in the world telling our stories from our perspective, that it's uh, we see our sector as a seeding ground for shifting a cultural and political terrain for our community. And that's the thing that I feel like is not only the promise of Latinx House, but frankly, like the uh, Monica's un, like dogged in her commitment to this work. And so being able to seed more and more of that kind of work that allows for our sector to model for the rest of the world what it looks like to be, to tell our stories, um, to hear our hurt, to create room for our leadership feels like the most meaningful contribution we can make in the next little bit. And frankly, necessary. Absolutely, yeah. Balante. Let's hope we get there sooner rather than later. Um, so thank you both for this very enriching uh, conversation and thank you for the audience for uh, joining in along uh, for this last and the first and hopefully there will be more critical conversation series by the Latinx House and the Ford Foundation. So thank you everyone and nos vemos pronto. Well, what a powerful conversation. Thank you so much, Hillary and Carmen, for your time and insights today. I'm so grateful to you. Um, I don't know if everyone knows, but Carmen, Hillary, the entire Ford family have been huge supporters of the Latinx House since we were created. And I personally have had the support of the Ford family through my work as a Ford Global Fellow. It's an honor to be part of that community and it's a community that Hillary actually created. So many, many thanks to you, Hillary, for that opportunity and for all that you're doing to help bridge the gaps and promote and achieve equality.
There are a lot of people that we need to thank. This has been a five month process of pulling these conversations together to make sure that we're talking about the richness of our community and to address the fact that we aren't a one issue community. There are many issues that we care about that we need to talk about. And we also have to name the fact that philanthropy needs to do better when it comes to investing in our community. We're grateful for the opportunity and the space to have these conversations. These conversations wouldn't be possible without a whole lot of people who've been pouring their hearts and their energy and their minds into this series. So thank you to David, to Anthony, to Delisa, and to everyone who's been involved in putting this series together. We also wanna give big love to our partners at Latino Rebels. They've helped to make sure that these conversations are accessible to people in the community, wherever you are. And also much gratitude to our family and friends who are part of this effort through humanity communications. We don't do our work alone and we never want to do our work alone. It takes all of us to make the kind of changes that we need to make in and for our world. You are part of that change. So many, many thanks to you for tuning into these conversations. I would love to encourage you, if you didn't check out the first conversations, go back and watch them. You can find them on our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on our social media at the Latinx House. And stay tuned, we have big things coming. Next up is Raizado Fest taking place in Aspen, Colorado. Follow us on our social media and learn more. Thank you all and keep up the important work that you're doing all around the country. Together we will win. This concludes today's critical conversation, achieving equity for the Latinx community. Thank you for joining us for our final episode. To watch all six episodes, please go to the Latinx House YouTube channel. Critical Conversations has been a Latinx learning series powered by the Latinx House and Ford Foundation with support from Hispanics in Philanthropy.